Hello, PsyQ community, and welcome to part two of our two-part series, Shared Decision-Making and Patient Empowerment in the Digital Age, a conversation between a clinician and patient advocate. Today's presentation will be patient engagement through technology. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Mark Takalowski, and I am a clinical science liaison for Otsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization Incorporated. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's discussion featuring Dr. Adam Kaplan and Kathy Day. This presentation is sponsored by Otsuka and Lundbeck. If you or someone you know is in crisis, please call the Suicide Prevention Hotline or Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK or text the Crisis Text Line at 741-741. Okay, let's walk through our objectives. Today, our speakers will introduce tools available to facilitate shared decision-making and patient empowerment, review the pros and cons of using technology to facilitate patient engagement, and discuss the impact of technology on patient engagement from the perspectives of a clinician and patient advocate. With that, I'll turn the presentation over to Kathy to get us started. Great, let's look at an overview of tools for facilitating patient empowerment. Mobile apps can really help with patient empowerment. Um, it provides a lot of autonomy. It, it helps with the, uh, the stigma because people are always using their mobile apps anyway, right? Nobody knows what it is you're tracking on your app. So if you're tracking your mood, if you're tra tracking your symptoms, it just looks like you're playing Facebook or something, who knows? So uh, mobile apps can be very beneficial in that way. And there are over 10,000 mental health apps that can track symptoms, that can educate, provide adjunct therapy, remind about medications, identify signs of relapse, prompting clinical intervention, um, facilitate shared de decision making. So it's, it's very critical to not just blast out and try to find a, an app on the internet, but try to do some really deep dives and learn which app is going to work for you and help with your specific needs. Not everyone wants the uh, the medication reminders. Maybe they're good with that already. So they don't need an app that will do that. Not everyone wants to track their symptoms, although I think it's pretty beneficial to do so. But again, it's up to that particular individual whether or not they find that beneficial. It's, you know, we all have our own preferences on that. So the main thing about these apps is that, you know, we can track information. It's really hard. Like if you see your doctor once a month, and something happens two days after the last one, and then you go see your doctor a month later, and they're like, what happened? I'm like, oh, I don't remember. So if you have an app that you can track information, then you can present that to your doc, and the doc can get a more realistic idea about what has been going on with you, and therefore work better with you to modify your treatment plan if necessary. So these can be very empowering to the patient because it is in their control. Nobody else has their phone. And so they're controlling that app and what they put into it. And by doing that, I think too, it, it's a visual for them. A lot of patients, a lot of people in general do better if they have a visual and they can compare one day to the next and see what's going on. So mobile apps can be very, very helpful in improving adherence, empowering patients, improving communication with the clinician too. Uh, I think that's a great point. Uh, those are all great points you bring up, Kathy. And, you know, it's always interesting to me, the unintended consequences, sometimes they're bad, but sometimes they're quite good. And uh, one thing that impresses me is that my patients, when they do track their mood, a lot of times they come in and they say, you know what, you've made me understand that this illness is not different from diabetes, where people have home glucometers or hypertension where they track their blood pressure, but now it's something that's real. I can show a graph of how my OCD is behaving, how my mood's behaving, how my anxiety is going over time. It makes it tangible. And that has a, a, an added layer of benefit. Sorry, I just wanted to interject that because it just follows on the points you made that are very important. So the pros to using apps, apps can educate the patient. Um, they they can be used from the home, as you know, Kathy pointed out these uh, as already. They may improve treatment adherence, and um, you know, there's there is uh, data out there to support many of these, and there are references here. Cons to these: well, the apps are not closely regulated, so these cons um, uh, really apply to the um, the fact that we don't have uh, yet. Um, a kind of Amazon for apps where you could go and see the ratings and see what people, maybe Amazon is not the good analogy, but 
go to a place um, where we can see does this app ensure the security of the individual? Is it regulated that they're not, you know, earning money off the individual by taking the data in a way that the patient might not want? Um, and then the quality is variable. There is ORCA, O-R-C-H-A, that reviewed 584 mental health apps and found that the majority did not meet quality threshold. And this just, it, you know, demonstrates that, like anything, um, you can get snake oil or good medicines, even good complementary medicines, but it just depends on, um, you know, the quality of what you use, trash in, trash out. So, and so these are examples of tools and organizations that evaluate mental health apps. So you're not alone out there. Um, you know, first of all, um, there's Mars, um, not the planet, but uh, um, the website, and they will provide uh, um, app ratings based on, you know, the kinds of uh, uh, criteria that you see there. There's ORCA, as we discussed, CyberGuide, uh, M Health App Trustworthiness Checklist, and APA App Advisors. And again, even within this list, you might find that one list fits your needs uh, and impresses you more than another. I'm not advocating any one of these. These are just to give you, as you want to give your patients, the opportunity to see a range of options. But there are options out there. That's the most important thing to know. So in terms of other digital tools, there are chatbots, and these are usually artificial intelligence gathered um, uh, based, that just means they have experience in responding to certain human responses, um, uh, and they get graded as to, they learn, is that a response that got the kind of, you know, um, uh, behavior from the individual. But these chatbots are really quite remarkable sometimes. They actually can do CBT and inform your patient about um, having them go through, uh, this is the problem I'm having, and then it goes through the problem and it provides information to the patient about how to overcome the problem. Quite impressive. Machine learning, uh, that's a fancy way of just saying, as opposed to just showing one risk factor like high cholesterol leading to uh, increased chance of having a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. This looks at all of the factors, uh, machine learning. It looks at age and sex and, um, you know, uh, cholesterol and et cetera, et cetera. And then that machine uh, algorithm will run all the various combinations of those together and find the one that most predicts that person having a heart attack. That's great because it can be highly predictive sometimes. Um, not as good that we don't learn from that information uh, for the patient. Text messaging is obvious, I think, uh, and when it comes in, uh, patients can have it come in to remind them to take their medicines. It can um, also, uh, you know, be uh, altered by the patient to fit their ideal time and and uh, and used in a personalized way. And rem sorry, remote patient monitoring. These are the fact that you know our smartphones now are so technologically savvy. They know where we are. They know you know light, dark, um, sounds, how often you're texting, how often you're on them. There's a, an enormous amount of information we can get from remote monitoring. So I think we discussed chatbots. Chatbots are animated technologies that enable communication between humans and computers using natural uh, language. Natural language means that the chatbots, again, use this artificial intelligence to interpret the language that's being used by the patient and figure out, gee, that's an emotion word, or gee, that's an anxiety word, and then where to go from there. Uh, they perform guided self-assessments. They track uh, scores over time, provide personalized links, uh, and Ultimately, if you know if they're good and the patient says that they're depressed and having thoughts of harming themselves, they will have a you know kind of fall out of the algorithm and refer that person to see somebody immediately. So they will help uh, those who are distressed. And what's interesting is in many studies, patients prefer, ironically, the ease of accessing when they want, um, you know, not having to leave home. Uh, so for a first pass, sometimes these can be useful. They also provide a way of keeping a mood diary. So Dr. Kaplan, chatbots sound like a really good tool. I'm not that familiar with them, but I can see, you know, that there are some pros. You can get instant access 24 seven. There's on anonymity, it helps with wait lists because boy, I'll tell you in the county mental health care system, the wait list is like weeks out to get into a psychiatrist. So having something that can help more immediately is is huge. Um, the youth are definitely going to be more likely to use something like this than, say, an older elderly senior person because of, of comfort. Not to say that 
uh, you know, I, I have a friend who's in her 90s and she uses her iPad all the time. So, you know, you know, it, it depends, but it just seems to be something we consider that the youth would be definitely able to engage in. And the access just makes it so much easier. Now, the one thing about it is some people may be a little off put by the artificial conversation um, that it's not really a real person that they're talking with. And so they may feel like it's a bit awkward to to work with a chat bot. But once they get used to it, I think that they could see that the uh, the information itself, it would normally be relevant. And, and I believe they learn with the person. I could be mistaken on that. But if, if they do, then it would become a little more uh, conversational, I think. Um, but they are, it, it is an amazing tool that I have really never thought that we would see something like this in, in my lifetime. But I'm very impressed with the idea of chatbots and I can see, you know, the pros and the cons and it's definitely a good tool. Yeah. I mean, it, you, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, certainly they're not as good as an empathic mental health practitioner would be able to provide, but they're a whole lot better than a non-empathic friend that the person might call. Um, and they can provide a lot of information as, as we had talked about in terms of, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and the like. So you're absolutely right. 